Probably me. You want to get our uh, zero wraps? Okay. All stations, that's uh, Hurricane Atlantic here from Congress. Copy. Starting This is an audio slate for dive H2023. UTC time is 1939.50. Bridge, go for now. Gallery one, Mr. Gazi. Atalanta is very dark. You get point the camera down. Snickety. Did you just use the word persnickety? <laughs> yeah. Love it. <laughs> Copy. It's, it's not behaving. Do you have the lights on?
Robert, are you good if I hold position now? You bet. Bridge, bridge now. Please hold position now. Thanks so much. Okay. And camera's down. Uh, so what's going on? Uh, I'd say your camera's not working. There we go. Uh, it's just that goofy auto iris. Okay. All right, you can go for 25 and I'll match-ish. Something, something amiss here. That shows me pointing that way. This shows me pointing that way. Those don't agree. I believe this more than I believe that. Robert, okay to hit uh, dive or dive special? What special? Dive or dive special, which is the oh, right. modified. Yeah. Thank there you. you go. No. ROV nav is. is uh, not available. <laughs> now go by the the volume. Volume's way more accurate. Yeah, that's full up. That's full up. Yeah. Sampled. That's so I got sampled. Yeah. yeah. To Z. But I think you write you write the gauge number though. Oh it does? For the, for Atlanta? Huh. would give you <laughs> but the the volume is what you really care about the the pressure yeah it, yeah 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 <clears throat> it's not really that critical just so you sort of eyeball it it's more like if it's continues to go down then we have an issue right and then we're leaking somewhere Made it worse. You're not supposed to do that. Oh man. Yeah. Well, that's not good. What happens if I change headings? So we have to pay attention to our uh, our wraps. So we're currently stretched out. So as long as we stay stretched out, we're we're gonna keep it zero here. But. I will try uh, going to the other heading sensor. 
So I'm going to do that now. So that didn't make a big difference here. Is that updating? What if I change heading? Oh, this is not, it's very unhappy. Going back to Octans. Okay, changing heading. Does that do anything? Not yet. That's a 90 degree change. You're broken. have bottom lock yeah because we have no beams I think he's he's just selecting the wrong heading input I think Hello and thank you to everyone that's joining us today. Related to the this is Dive 2023 out on Nautilus. We appreciate you joining us. We have a short descent today compared to what it is that we've been used to doing or their expected maximum depth of 755 meters. Our mission today is to dive a scuttled submarine from World War II. We'll be focusing on the I-201. This was a high-speed submarine that was built by the Imperial Japanese Navy and surrendered to the United States in 1945. It's been about 14 years since this site has last been visited. So our focus and our interest today is to look at the deterioration process as well as uh, do some immersive imaging, which we're super excited about, putting that into that um, technology that we've been practicing on each of the missions and the dives that we've done so far, as well as doing a little bit of our Norbit mapping. And then also hopefully seeing a little bit of, uh, a little bit of life to see what kind of an ecosystem is built up around this particular submarine. Since we have such a short descent, I want to say good morning to Kristen in our back row back here. Would you like to say hello this morning? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Kristen Mitchell in the uh, data logger seat today. Uh, I work at the Office of Naval Research when I'm not on aboard the Nautilus. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to see these dives. I always thought kind of I might do archaeology, and I, I never got into it. So now I'll get to participate a little bit. It is going to be exciting. I'm, I'm very interested in seeing um, this as well. This is definitely going to be a high point of our trip for sure. Yeah. Good morning, hey. Jonathan. <laughs> Good morning. Do you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little soft in my earpiece, but this is all good. Uh, I'm excited. I have just been digging into the history of this submarine. There's so much. It's it's really fascinating. It is. Um, you keep sending these updates, and I'm like, I don't have I time know, to feel, read this, but I, I, I go, bad. I want it's to. Like the one I just sent is 34 pages, but it's all like, uh, so the, it turns out the, this submarine was surrendered in Japan. And, uh, and the U.S., there's the report that I just shared with the team here on board is what at the time was this classified report of the technologies that were different and more advanced or unique to the Japanese submarines than to the US or German submarines that, that we had ex had also collected intelligence on or were our own. And it goes into all the classes of the subs and it speaks about the, the I-201 um, as having some of these really unique features. And then as you 
comb through these other sources, uh, you hear about the trials and tribulations as the, the this submarine was towed from Japan to first to Guam and then uh, it, tr it tried to make its way under its own power to Guam with another submarine and a salvage ship and there was like fires on board in oh, the battery wow. room and they ended up getting towed through a typhoon. Oh like, my gosh. Yeah, it's quite the, it was quite the story but there was, um, you know, this wasn't a uh, submarine associated with it hadn't seen action in the war yet it just right. was constructed and uh, was surrendered before it had any war patrols and so the, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a sub that had sunk US Navy ships or vice versa and so uh, it was basically built it looks like in uh, 1944 in March yeah 44 and then uh, surrendered in 45 and and used as target practice in 46 and so I mean, one thing that jumps out at me as we were, as I was doing this reading is the production rate of these submarines. They wanted a, a submarine a month to come out of the That's shipyard insane. in this class. And you think about today with the U.S. Navy's Virginia class submarines, uh, we're not, we're, I think we're one a year wow. hoping for two. Is it? And wow. I, I should probably verify that, but you know, when you, when the threat of your entire nation being, uh, Rod? Destroyed is on the line, you know, the just amazing feat of engineering. So hopefully as we get more, uh, we get cameras on the sub, we can find some of these unique fe features, like they removed the deck and the deck guns from the sub to have a more high-speed submarine. It, the I-201 was thought to be able to do 20 knots, verified to like 16 knots, submerged. The U.S. Navy submarines at the time were doing 8 to 10 knots, so... Uh, it's just really interesting. I can't wait to see. Yeah, the technology for the time was already uh, already ahead of itself. It's gonna be it's gonna be awesome to see this for sure. I just like this report with it. Just notes the differences. You know the nuances in the periscope and the nuances in how they vent batteries and you know, on and on, make water, all these things that were not necessarily better or worse, but just different that allowed, you know, us to have a different engineering perspective as we and so this the is the I-201, I-201 that we'll be taking a look at today. Someone just verifying that. Yeah, there's this report is just incredible. So much to to learn. I'm hoping to be able to share as much of this with you guys today as possible. In particular, the imaging that we're going to be able to get, um, and in the quality, for sure, it's going to be outstanding to see this on our on our fisheye lens as we get that view come into hand. So my name is Devin. I am your science communications fellow on board. Um, when I am not with Nautilus, I'm sixth grade science teacher back in Tennessee. Woohoo! Yeah, I met with my last group of kids today. It's my sixth period class. They've all lost their minds. They're ready for you. They're oh yeah, they're ready. I'm sure the sub is too. She's <laughs> like, yeah, get back here, get back here. <laughs> it's gotta be super rewarding. It is. It is. It's. It's nice to know that they've missed me. I can tell by their. By their constant up in the camera waves. I think they were really just happy to see themselves on screen. Also true. Yeah. <laughs> you've been great, having any great homework and stuff while you've been out here, though, right? Yeah, I'm keeping the grades in the grade book, getting those con conversations happening. Um, I've had a Padlet up in a Google Classroom specific for this cruise that kids have been able to reach out to me, ask me questions about what I'm doing and about our missions. So I've been super excited to be able to share every day yeah. back and forth with them with what we've been doing. 
Had a highlight yesterday. I was on the monkey deck, saw a manta ray swim by. That was phenomenal. The timing of that was just perfect. I nearly dropped my phone. <laughs> and that, like, that's the first time I nearly almost lost it going over. I could not get to it fast enough. I was like, look, just take a little picture. Just a little one. And we saw a large accumulation of, I don't know if it was an algae bloom or something that had just kind of been passing through us all day long and then and then finally a large uh, large chunk of it and I was like that makes sense they must have been coming to and from apparently this is the time of year for those algae blooms yeah I read up on it. yeah I'm, I'm here at the right time right spot I guess so Jonathan I had a question I, I think I know the answer because I've been learning from you something just uh, volumes. Um, we have a viewer that's wondering what the wide angle range of the cameras that we're seeing on channel one. Oh. Am I correct in saying 180 degrees? Yes. Yes. High five. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Yeah, those are um, two stereo fish eyes. At least that's their current configuration so they can collect um, 3D depth data um, on each one of the uh, camera lenses, and it's also uh, kind of a little bit plug-and-play for VR headsets. Perfect. Um, having two cameras like that uh, really aids uh, the photogrammetry process. And uh, something that you can't see, because this is called triclops. Uh-huh. The big guy. The third camera is actually up in the bumper bar right now of Hercules. So the bar that has all of the lights, uh, the forehead of the ROV, um, that camera is actually pointed at a 45-degree angle downwards. Um, to kind of, uh, you can imagine it as filling in the cracks of flatter terrain mm -hmm. um, so that we can rapidly build uh, three-dimensional models that have a lot more realism to them and a lot more detail than uh, one camera can, buy, can provide alone. We've had some amazing, amazing imagery that we've been able to look to see. Um, just the reefs that we've been on to be able to look at the coral. You're working on those right now. It's been, it's been phenomenal. Uh, and I've been very excited to share with my students the possibility of, of this being yeah. available to them and to them learning how to operate it and, and then maybe one day being a part of the creation process of it. It's super cool. You know, I'd love to know your perspective on how you would use it in a classroom. Oh, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that. Let me think yeah. about that for a little bit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that the proximal goals of this um, Crews are really talking about process. Um, how do we integrate a camera system like this into our existing operations? Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the what are the pros and cons of doing something you can see right now? And this is just the configuration for this cruise. Right now, those cameras are taking up extremely valuable science real estate. Um, they don't have to be configured that way. We've tested multiple little spots that we could put them. Uh, but the end goal is going to be to either create virtual um, kind of virtual reality experiences or um, doing a video game style environment. So instead of assigning the kids, hey, I want you to watch this not a nice live video, uh -huh. you can in fact have a, a little bit of a planned lesson. I'm excited to work with other teachers to say, okay, let's just pretend that we had a perfect coral model, like, like the one we scanned two days ago. Right. How would you use that in class? What are the important lessons that we could integrate into this spot where you can fly around a virtual Hercules around this massive biodiversity spot? Well, for sure, learning about the ecosystems. Yeah. yeah. Um, sixth grade for me, I teach a lot of uh, currents, so we could be looking at um, salinity levels, Yeah. Like oxygen that. levels, mm -hmm. um, temperature levels, obviously, because it go along with the currents very much. So there's... There's a lot we could plug into that for sure. Yeah, I think that's that's one of those things. We have so much sensor data currently available in all of the ROVs. Um, we've got temperature, salinity. We have the observations themselves. All of these elements kind of go together, and we can place them pretty dynamically in this world in mm -hmm. ways that are not possible right now with a traditional video. Yeah. Um, I'm excited about uh, doing something like that across uh, space. And then... You know, using the models themselves as the base of reality. But then there's nothing stopping us from creating a little bit of fantasy around it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Data-derived 
fantasy but we can proceed to really generate items like we know that this is probably a rock and we know in this area there could be these types of species now go explore on your own and mm -hmm. go find this see what you can find yeah and imagine if we placed uh sea urchins where sea urchins go right um, you know and we had a little bit of a pokemon go or if they had uh, the students build the ecosystem appropriately. Right. So yeah. if we had those different uh, organisms available to them, but because of the depth or because of the salinity level, they would have to place them in the exact and literally build the correct model of an yep. ecosystem. So there you go. Yep. All of those things. It'd Exciting. Be absolutely awesome. Much better than the piece of paper that um, we sometimes have to give out. Necessary, but way cooler to do that with a vo virtual virtual world and it doesn't necessarily supplant it like we can oh, still, yeah you still have that but i would love if you got your homework and you had to fill out your paper but then you were able to point kids to a more dynamic experience that they mm -hmm. can learn on their own i i just imagine my kids trying to grow up in that environment with that yeah. resource to learn about ocean to learn about the work of nautilus learn about opportunities and 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 ocean literacy and in careers um, an incredible world that opens right at the door their fingertips right there literally that's, yeah that's that's it's just absolutely on point and, and so important for for what we're trying to do um, I'm just excited I got that question right for you <laughs> nailed it not so great but <laughs> uh, front row do you guys have a second to say hello very good sorry i think most people up here are busy right now but i can start it's okay i, I saw you guys had some things going on i didn't want to interrupt <laughs> no thanks uh, but yeah, I'm Human Moeen. I'm a ROV engineering intern on this trip. Uh, and I am in the Atalanta pilot seat. And when I'm not here, I'm a mechanical engineering student at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, which is my hometown too. Nice, thank you. Yeah, I'm Robert Waters. I'm a Hurt pilot today, or this morning. And looking forward to uh, diving on this wreck site here. Should be exciting. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Johan Becker. Uh, I'm the navigator on this ship shift. And yeah, also looking forward to seeing what we see down here. Last but not least. I was going to say that leaves but one. <laughs> Actually, there's a few more after me. Uh, we have some folks dialing in from shore, so oh, nice. I'll, uh, I'll transition to them. Um, my name's Pete Forderson. I'm running uh, the video systems uh, in the control van for uh, the Nautilus today. So um, I control what gets routed down channel three, uh, or what we call sat feed three, and uh, make sure all the record systems are working. And everybody's having a wonderful viewing experience in the control van. And we appreciate that. Uh, so it looks like we have two people on V-Link from shore. We have Hans, Hans and Phil. Are you guys uh, able to speak? And if you don't want to speak, that's fine too. And, and yeah, no, we, we'd be glad to. Uh, can I just uh, you guys copy me over there on the ship? Oh, can I just step in just for a moment? we got to wrap up the, the talk here in a minute. So I'll just don't, don't go on for too long. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> We're approaching the bottom and we need attention and focus on that. Why do that? So well, I didn't mean to cut you right off. That's okay. We're <laughs> that's we, a, we are I very get in there and warn you ahead of time. Very about. super excited that okay. these gentlemen are able to join us. We're really looking forward to sharing uh, having their knowledge to support yeah, yeah. this so the, mission. We'll have time for uh, kind of detailed conversation when the plan here 
is to uh, get to the bottom. We'll make a quick assessment of our general location and relative to the wreck, and then we're going to co conduct a Norbit survey to start off with the multi-beam. So that'll give us this detailed map of the area, orient us to any sort of other uh, debris or hazards, and then uh, then we'll begin kind of the filming and and uh, photogrammetry around the wreck. So when we're doing that Norbit survey, we'll be up off the bottom and and we'll be in a good place to to really dig into the intros and who's on the line. Okay. <clears throat> okay. The, the zone, is that the danger zone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we know the orientation of the thing? Uh, really? Huh. So I'm in close, you know, because I'm out in front. So if you want to back off, then you need to do it quick. Okay. I'll, I'll start backing off. But. So we can get Humon to put it, uh, put it up over here or here. What do you want? You want? I would like to see the Norbit display. Maybe you can put it on here. We don't care about that right now. Yeah. Uh. You can. I know monitor right, and then I can press a button, but I'm not sure which one it is. If he puts it on, uh, uh, Pete, can you help out here? Yeah, I, uh, come on, uh, control alt X gets you on the KVM. Well, we have the switcher here. I don't know what it's called on that because Norbit. Was Norb, Norb. Oh, you got there. Norbit there? Okay. Yeah. Can we? Yeah. Can you? Stand by. What? Uh, there you yeah, go. Yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody assumes there's like a secret code to know which button, and it actually calls out there's for the first time secret, the, the specific code. name. <laughs> Norb. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That didn't take control, right? Did it? No. No. no you dude. should be good. How big is that circle? Yeah. Okay, what? so we're coming down on the point here. We're going to stop at 35. Oh, you're switching over. So you're stopping at about 7. I'm gonna stop at B e altitude 35. So okay. That, yeah, you could probably adjust for start, yeah. Get your stick out of there and yeah. get ready. We're good. We're on. We're on the outside this way. It's all great. Yeah, that was the plan. Here we are, we're at 35 ish. And we are, yeah, we're in position. I think they want to circumnavigate the whole thing. Oh, you just want to do a sweep? 
Well, what it, I think you should decide what you want. You're the sonar expert. Cool. Okay. Yeah. No. We'd be better mowing the lawn, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wait, which is not a bad idea? The circle or the... <laughs> okay. Roger. And the orientation of it, hopefully. I love it. We're already using that as a tool. Do you have a target on here yet? No. You don't. Maybe we don't want a target, do we? I think we were going slower. I'll, uh, yeah. Anyway, we'll try this. I'm not exactly straight, but of course. And how far are we going? We're going to do 180? Or yeah. Okay, so you're all set, and uh, here, here we go. Okay. You want me to leave? What is that, 50 meters per division? 10, 10, 20, 30, yeah. Is that good speed? Too fast? Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to keep this camera angle? Uh, it doesn't matter doing this. We're just going to stay right there. Oh, and just rotate around? Yeah. Okay. probably move in though so we're not stretched out because if, if we get it yeah and come on you can come down so we don't want to get yanked because that'll cause uh yeah. yankiness in the sonar data i uh, will come down to about eight how does that sound yeah
soon. We should see something coming up here soon. Hopefully. Devin, we'll be uh, we'll be conducting the survey for another 10, 15 minutes. If you wanted to, uh, if we could catch the folks that are sure. ashore and introductions. Absolutely, I'd love to do that. I wasn't for sure if we had started that mapping process yet, but that's yeah, fantastic. Good. Well, welcome to everybody who uh, is joining us right now. We're very glad that you are with us. This special dive that we're working on today, one that we're all very excited about. Uh, I am your science communications fellow, Devin. And I am here with uh, the back row crew. I'm a sixth grade science teacher in Clarksville, Tennessee, when I am not aboard the Nautilus. Um, and our dive mission today is to go and explore. Well, we've got a couple of different things that we're working on. The mapping. Um, we're going to do some photogrammetric imaging, the immersive technology with the imaging there, uh, as well as um, some initial research on the deterioration of a Japanese submarine uh, that's not been viewed for the last 14 years. So we're very interested in taking a look at the deterioration process, uh, what types of an environment uh, this has been able to develop and create for organisms uh, in the area. So what type of ecosystem has been um, built up around that. Uh, and then just get some really great imaging um, so that we can use to add towards the collection of fantastic imagery that we have had along. Yeah, this we've series. had we've had amazing biology and geology on this expedition, and this is the first man-made st structure that we're going to image in the in the deep sea. Yes. And so it's a different sort of challenge, you know, especially to how to position the ROV to to image and model something like this. So that's the that's going to push the technical chops of the new camera system and our workflows that we have here mm -hmm. on the ship. That's the that's our goal, um, but we're really excited to share um, another look at this site that's been previously explored and see what what changes have occurred as kind of a secondary objective. Yes, it's quite interesting, and we have uh, a fantastic crew on this shift right now. If anybody's we capable of making this happen, it's us. No, All of us. I mean, there's not a there's not a there's not. I didn't mean to minimize anybody there there's not well, no, a shift there's no, that there's no better watch section no, than not at all. to 12. i mean we we set everyone up elves up for success we do we do yeah. sorry i did too much chatter i think uh. <laughs> <laughs> our shift is primarily focused on getting um getting the equipment right where it needs to be getting the scientific and uh, data collection for uh, Norbert getting a good layout of the bottom of the ocean floor and then uh, really allowing everybody else that falls behind us to get the uh, the viewing phase of, of once we have everything in place. Yep, and it's worked out really, really well that the time, you know, I, it's not really to say that we're sacrificing our time on the no, bottom. No, not but, at all. Not but, at all. Uh, but the work that we put in making the map leads the next watch sections to have targets to prosecute that yes. and, and just more information than we had going into the dive. And so it's worked out exceptionally well. And we've gotten into a groove where, where we, we're really good at doing the part that we do. You know? Yeah. And so yes. it's worked out just yeah. fantastic. It is. It's, it's a great, great shift to be on. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. And I've learned a lot. So I had someone asking about the... Uh, they were going to be able to get the three set of to the triclops to get a view from that, but we're not able to today, right? The way that we have this set up, we actually have the third camera mounted in a different position. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, you won't be able to see the third of the triclops. Uh, it's up on the bumper bar where the lights are, um, and that's to maximize our field of view when we're doing photogrammetry and being able to kind of have that top-down perspective of um, the environment around us. Uh, so uh, you won't be able to see that, but you will see the results in some of the uh, photogrammetric models that we create throughout this dive today. Um, and all of those models that we do create today are, at, at least in the past dives, we'll be able to put up and kind of uploading uh, them all to our Sketchfab um, as we speak. Um, so 
quite quite interesting. And in fact, on our computer right now, I'm working to uh, and have just uploaded actually Good. fantastic model of some coral, uh, really ancient corals that we imaged a couple of days ago. So go to sketchfab.com slash evnautilus to see those. We, we know that they were estimated at well over a thousand years old, those corals. That's incredible. That's absolutely. That's incredible. Yeah. And, and our, uh, our listeners and watchers very appreciative of the fact that this is happening on a Friday so that they can stay up late and follow along for this ship. We've got um, about 11 hours scheduled for our dive today. Yeah, we got a little a little late start off the off the deck uh, due to some troubleshooting with the winch. The uh, winch. But, but we have such a capable team of ROV pilots and the deck team that uh, that only took you know maybe 25 minute delay. Yeah. And was it uh, bad? I mean, I saw they had the the drawings out and were had the multimeter and within just a few minutes it identified what it was, made a a repair and had us you know, off the deck and in the water. So kudos to them for keeping the mission moving forward. I wonder if, if Phil and Hans are on. I was just uh, going to say, we've got some yeah, special guests that will be joining us for this mission. They could introduce themselves. Yeah. Put a voice to the name. <laughs> I'd be glad to. Um, yeah, this is Hans Van Tilburg and uh, followed by Phil Hartmeyer. But um, I had the pleasure of being on the recent cruise to um, Papahanaumokuakea and the Midway missions to the aircraft carriers, so I missed the good times in the van. I'm a NOAA maritime archaeologist historian for our Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And I also had the opportunity to be with the Hurl folks, Hawaii Undersea Research Lab following the discovery of these two subs in 2009 and part of those surveys that led to the Hunt for Samurai Subs documentary. So this will be great to see these things again. And on this side, we have a number of those images from the 2009 survey, which will allow us to compare the deterioration or the status of, uh, of the properties as well. So thanks OET, OET team, it's great to be a part of this mission. Go ahead, Phil. Hey, Hans. Great to uh, be able to join you and the rest of the OET community and family here. It's, um, it, it's just a humbling honor to be doing this again after the great successes um, from the Battle of Midway Expedition uh, just earlier in September. My name is Phil. I'm a marine archaeologist at NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research and contracted by the University of Exploration throughout the Earth. Currently lead the marine archaeology program there, um, and we're also joined uh, ashore by several other scientists, including uh, Dr. James Bogata, who's also part of the Midway Expedition, uh, and others. So the chat's been active, and we're excited to, uh, to get the science back into a one. Thanks. Do you want to do this? We're very excited to have you all a part of this. Thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to the insight that you'll be able to bring uh, into the images that we'll be seeing. So we landed 100 meters away from the target and uh, we are going to norbit our way towards uh, our first uh, Norbit multi-beam pirouette didn't resolve the target, so we're going to keep moving that way. We decide we were going to the deck using the mesotech. Okay, going down.
Okay. I am happy with that. ISO 100. Element. Lock and record. Focus. Continuous autofocus. Boom. Say again, Pete. Okay. Okay. We're honored for any and all participation, so that's great. All right, and for uh, for Hans and Phil, we're uh, we're just getting the chat warmed up here, so I'll see if, if that is helpful. I guess we can do the white balance while we're waiting for the ship move. Let's uh, do video, it. Pete. I have uh, triclops up and uh, stable now for OBS. Copy that. Kristen, you can keep an eye on this too, the chat, just to back me up. Okay. I think it comes up as data logger. So yeah, feel free to introduce yourself and... Sorry, what? Okay. Quickie do a white balance. The crew doing the interactions is having a heck of a time. I hear the laughter coming out of the studio they, behind us. They are I love really it. enjoying that class that they're working with for sure. It's fantastic. You can see on satellite feed one, we're going to do our white balance check. go dark for about 10 seconds while we uh, calibrate the cameras. Thank you. Johan, while we're uh, sitting here doing this, do you mind uh, giving us your strategy on how we're going to find and approach and kind of the next few moves? Sure thing. So, uh, using our Herc mounted uh, multi beam sonar, we did a kind of circle sweep about what we thought would be 75 Alrighty. meters south. Well done. And with Thank that, you. we were seeing 100 meters in all directions. And we expected that to show us where, just at least the general direction that the. Are we good? We are would good. Be. Thank you. Okay. Um, but we didn't see anything, so now we're approaching the target, and we've dropped down to the sea floor, and we're going to approach with our uh, mesosonars, which look forwards. So and we're going old school, is yeah. what you're saying. All right. And then we also have Norbit sideways, but since we're a little uh, close to the deck, altitude is not that high. We're not well, seeing we're, as far yeah, it's, out. It's 90 degrees off of where we want to look. Right. So. That that would give us the side views. And yeah. 
All right, let's do it. Great. Bridge, bridge, now. Three zero at zero three zero. So we have Herc about six meters off the bottom, and we expect the wreck to be about 5.4 meters proud of the seafloor. Um, and with our our forward, our, our sonars spinning around, we should be able to see that feature. Yeah, so to uh, level set with everybody, we expect the submarine to, originally it was 79, meters long, had a beam of 9.2 meters. Uh, let's see what else is helpful here. Four forward torpedo tubes, submerged to a depth of 110 meters. Top speed 16 knots submerged, which was twice as fast as its American counterparts at the time. Powered by two 10 cycle German engines, producing 2,750 shaft horsepower. We are currently running about 763 meters. Had a range of 6,000 miles at 14 knots, 15,000 miles at six knots. In the chat, uh, Hans mentioned that the bow of the submarine is broken from the main hull and it's, it's supposed to be in the general area here. Yeah, I appreciate Sorry, that. general area here, like where we're at, or? No, the, the whole wreck site. The, at the wreck site. Yeah, the wreck location is, yeah. is there's not, two components to it. Yeah, not that it's here, close by where we are. No. No. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the sub was surrendered in Japan and attempted to be uh, sailed across the Pacific, Guam, Johnson Atoll, to Hawaii, uh, but ended up having a battery fire midway through and, and had to be towed and uh, arrived in Pearl Harbor. It was put in the basically mothball fleet it was inspected to kind of gain all the insight and intelligence we could from the submarine and then um, destined to be target practice for the Navy a year later. And so that's the, the two pieces of the hull are due to the, uh, the torpedoing of the 201. And I think there is a YouTube video of the actual uh, See if I can find it. If not this sub, something representative uh, from 1946. Oh, yeah, here we go. I-201 sunk by a single torpedo from the USS Queenfish. May 23rd, 1946. So it's that detonation that we'll be, uh, we'll see the damage of during today's dive. You see like these little feet print almost in 
satellite feed one. Like there's a little trail that's going through. I mean, we should just follow the trail. That's uh, when uh, Dr. Ballard tells the Titanic story. It was following the having a general understanding of the currents yeah. in the area and following the debris path to Titanic. Right? Yeah. So tried and true method for wreck hunting. If I had to guess, I'm gonna Jonathan's gonna be running the camera for us, and it looks like uh, water clarity. The you know there's plenty of life here in the. Water, it's going to be probably his number one frustration today, if yeah. I had to guess. Unfortunate for us, those things tend to get on in the way for him. Um, so we can't usually just stop and zoom in and say hi. Yeah, yeah. Check things out, but that's okay. It's interesting with the two different camera systems. You have a, you know, with the, the Triclops, very high resolution. Uh, collecting images, uh, we've sc scaled it way back, but one image every second, we can move very quickly, quicker than her can move on these uh, photogrammetry surveys. Yes. And, uh, but yet, we don't use it for those beautiful zooms that we get out of Zeus. So we have these tensions between do we go fast and, yeah. and complete the, the objective of this project, and how do we balance in the, the use of Zeus and the beautiful zoom that it provides that is kind of the Nautilus standard that everyone's accustomed to. I know the biologists on the coral dive, as we were kind of zipping by, <laughs> things yeah. were cursing, not stopping and zooming, but we've got a few competing objectives with this camera testing. That's a great picture that we have on satellite feed two of coming from at Atlanta, taking a, a peek down at, at Hercules. Great perspective from from where we are in the ship, looking looking down a little bit. Yeah, that'd be great. Can you, yeah, can you fix it? <laughs> We're like co-typing. <laughs> U, U, R, I. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that was awkward. You can feel the ships going. Yeah. Yeah. That's not that. The winch isn't falling apart. <laughs> I felt that too back here. My first instinct was to look at Jason and be like, "What was? What was that?" But yeah, all good. So we've had a few winch winch <laughs> gremlins throughout this cruise, and now everybody's on high alert for any sort of <laughs> noise and unusual shutter. Yeah. That's the dynamic positioning going full blast. So it sounds like in the chat that the um, submarine broke in two uh, quite sharply. And they're hoping to get some measurements on these pieces using the modeling that we're going to do today. Ooh, very okay. excited for that. Norbit photogrammetry mashup I see coming. This is going to be great. Uh, speaking on that, did the lasers, are we still down one laser? Lasers? Now you want lasers? You're like anti-laser well, forever. I was pro-laser. I'm, st I'm, I'm just still in anti-laser <laughs> camp. <laughs> I'm just happy when there's two lasers you and not one. You just want everything working. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very valuable. Those, those sacrifices. Um, 
Uh, just wait. Okay, just so we're like mighty close and nothing's happening here. Yeah, I think we. Yeah, I think we gotta do that. Okay. All right, you gotta. How much of a move you got in there still? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything on the on the Mesotech that's more than 100 meters. Yeah. Are we sure on this position? So uh, the vibration on the ship, I guess they're running the fire pump uh, is what, oh, we're, what yeah. we're feeling. Oh, you can see the water coming off the, the stern there from the yep. fire hose. Sort of pulsing. <laughs> Fire pump. Okay, so we're stopped here, so I'm gonna come up. Coming up. How high are we coming up? Uh, we're gonna come up 40 meters off the bottom. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if I can. Is that right? Uh, approximate. It might be like two oh. or three more meters over here. But we're on top of it according to the pretty much. what I love so much about this shift is the patience that we all have as we're just kind of getting everything set up but the truth of it is there's the the technicality of everybody getting everything just where it needs to be so that next shift that comes on has it all lined up and ready to go mm. squid uh oh Fiddlesticks. <sighs> Fiddlesticks? Oh, um, yeah. I was inspired by the word you used earlier. What was that? Oh. It started with a P, didn't it? <laughs> oh, persnickety. Persnippity. Pers persnippity and fiddlesticks. Persnickety. 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 <laughs> These are solid SPL words for <laughs> problems. 
And we are diving to I-201. Imperial Japanese Navy submarine. It was scuttled right. in World War II. Thank you for asking your questions. We're just now trying to find that sweet spot where we'll begin the imagery. All right. Doing a spin. We're gonna. Are we going to half a uh, half a degree? Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, which way we want to go? We want to go. To port. Here we go. Here we go. Started. Looking at that detritus, it's almost like a solar system filled with stars there. It's all floating around. Is that is something way out there? It's quite a ways out. You're talking yeah. about that one? Yeah. Yeah. Must be kind of vertical, right? There you go. Yeah. That's a pretty strong return out there. Or, just, or an artifact, one or the other. <laughs> that is pretty far away from uh, what we have for a target, though. So it's it's Human's making the racket today. Oh. Maybe you're making. Are you making racket too? Did it come up? Yeah. Nope. You're not making racket. It's, that's interesting. <laughs> Every day we switch off. <laughs> that's really interesting. Human, I think Johan might have set you up for that one. <laughs> yeah, I think he sabotaged my mic <laughs> earlier. <laughs> you were in here alone, I saw it. <laughs> when you weren't looking, he switched headsets. We tried switching headsets and it didn't didn't help anything. Nah, yeah. That's location. Alright, this is... 
How is that? Noisy. Okay, sweet. Usually it's Robert that says that, so. But <laughs> yeah. Are we there yet? What's our uh, depth? Uh, uh, 723. But we're 40 meters up. Oh. Okay, so the target depth 778, just as a point of reference. Yeah. Johan? Can you reach back here? That that's where. Just verify all that for me. Yeah, let me plug it in and see where that is. Yeah, thanks. So we're just <laughs> triple and quadruple checking. We're in the right place, uh, but haven't found a, a mistake or a typo yet. So we know it's been 14 years since this was last viewed. Mm. Uh, what kinds of things would people be expecting to see differently from the images that we have had before? Yeah, that's exactly where we have the target. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we just confirmed that Jason didn't screw this up. That's basically <laughs> all that comment was. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah, good job. Congratulations uh, on yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, I was sweating bullets there for a minute. Dr. Ballard was in. You know, did you find it? And I was like, did I mistype it? I was like, oh yeah. boy. All right, so. So I guess their depth is about 20 meters deeper than we are experiencing So that's a, that's a lot. I mean, that's a big depth error. Difference. Well, 15, but still. That's a lot, you know? So a lot of times, let's use, let's kind of find that depth Contour 778, Johan, and maybe we, if we're starting a survey, let's bias ourselves towards that to get to that depth. Hey, just um, just checking in. Uh, is, are you referring to a depth that's from the hurl data? Yeah. Okay, Roger. Yeah. So, do you know if they do a, a corrected depth with the uh, uh, off? Uh, it's all, yeah, I've got. I've got it uh, just listed as correct. You know, there's no asterisks or uh, notation. Uh. So. to head approximately 220 meters kind of southwest. Like back where south. we were. But we did a circle. Far past where we were. Far past. Yeah. Huh. Well, we've got a 200, what, a 200 meter swath on the Norbit if we're flying at our 30, 35 meter altitude. Yeah, so about 100 in each direction. And, uh, Renny, you're listening in. If you've got any advice, uh, feel free to chime in. But I think we 
we work our way towards that depth contour. Yeah, depth is typically more accurate. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll come up in the van. I'll see you in one second. Yeah, I appreciate it. I only chuckle because we've this expedition has been uh, basically ten separate sprints. We've we had five locations, but then uh, we dove at uh, two different locations within each spot, and we've kind of nailed it each time. You yeah, know? yeah. And so you're the one with like the best, the best point, like the biggest shiniest target. We're, we're, we struck out on our first like go round. Uh, it's funny. So we, we're lucky that the Norbit multi-beam is a great tool uh, to have this, to have on the vehicle to allow us to to find this sort of target. So we'll get a little survey going and run a, a few little lines um, and hopefully acquire what we're looking for. One thing we couldn't do on this expedition based on the our permitting with the Office of Naval Research is run the ship's multi-beam, which would have been the... Uh, the target's big enough, would it, we would have resolved it with the multi-beam on the ship, but it, that's off the table for this expedition, so the Norbit is our uh, best tool. Uh, you got something weird here with the heading. Let, let me reinitialize that. Yeah, no problem. Jason, can you give some clarification? Someone would uh, was interested in, in knowing the reason not to use the ship's multi-beam? Uh, so the Office of Naval Research Navy-wide has a cap on the amount of acoustic energy that they can put into the ocean. This is like a regulatory thing that the kind of constraints that they work within. And so uh, we looked at the mission objectives for this cruise. And uh, we could have advocated kind of strongly to use our multi-beam, but, but with uh, this expedition going to known locations to test the camera in those conditions, we had pretty reliable information. And I'm right. not saying that even this point today isn't reliable, right? This is kind of the nature of this business. Yeah. So we made the decision to not propose to ONR to use the multi-beam on this crew so that it wouldn't affect their kind of account balance in this acoustic energy calculation allowing other research that they have sponsored to, to use that allocation. So it could be overwhelming for uh, the amount of sonar beams that are going out in case there's others that are using it as well. It's not, is it specific to animals in the area? No, no, no. This is like, no. uh, this is like um, I'm trying to think of a decent analogy. Uh, so if you imagine the Office of Naval Research has hundreds and hundreds of projects going on, Right. That that um, that the Navy to be good stewards of the potential impact of acoustic energy in the water, like you said, to animals, they've set a limit. Right. At certain frequencies, and uh, and so I guess we didn't want to contribute to increasing that total, um, and didn't need to. Right, because we have the Norbit. 
we and we had we, we had, had good good points good information and, yeah there was no need for us to to do that and the norbit runs on higher frequencies than the ship's multi-beam uh, the ship's multi-beam is 30 kilohertz ish and uh, the norbit has a range of 200 to 400 kilo 200 to 600. 200 to 600. I was hoping Chris would jump in. A much and lower power. Did somebody than say this. Norbit? <laughs> <laughs> Chris. A much uh, lower power than what the ship puts out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So less impactful and didn't doesn't meet the threshold for reporting uh, that the Navy has. So that that was our decision to do um, to do the Norbit. So we. Still getting lots of use on that, and still can um, have okay, a successful so, mission based so off of that. So we're done with yep. that, right? We're done with that circle. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Johan. I think our survey is going to be the first line. Maybe is directly from kind of where we are to seven seven eight when you get that contour up. And then we'll just expand yeah. out from there off well, of that you track. Take a wrap, you wrap out, and I'll deal with mine, I guess. Yeah, I should. Yeah, I wouldn't mention it. I mean, it was a known, that's a known thing that was going to happen. Yeah, great comments in the chat from Hans about the. Uh, the changes in con condition, you know, the the I-201 is, uh, because it was optimized for high speed, they removed the deck off the, the top of the sub and the anti-aircraft, uh, the large anti-aircraft guns were removed that were similar, that were, you know, found on uh, other Japanese submarines. This sub only has a 25 millimeter retractable gun that can sink down into a uh, uh, cabinet in the deck, a small deck. And so the he's noting that you know these deterioration on these smaller features. Sorry. Uh. Dissimilar metals, um, scouring from bottom currents, and then all kinds of marine life over the course of 14 years. And there's a reference to a polypogon sponge, a personal favorite of Hans's. So a maybe polypron? Poly po polio pogon sponge. And Hans is a, he's got V Link, so he can chime in with my uh, okay. butchering of that pronunciation. It's a perfect favorite favorite <laughs> of him. Polypogon. Well. One more time. Polypogon. Right. That's what I thought you said, Jason. Yeah. Right. Okay, so, I, okay. <laughs> Come on, Kristen, you're seeing the same thing I am. You didn't even take a stab at that. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're, the nav team is getting the uh, depth contour in. All right, I've got some other insight rolling in. All right, I'm gonna provide this to my team. I'm becoming very partial to the jellyfish that we get to see on descent. Hans or Phil, can you comment on how much change you would expect to see in 14 years at this site? 
a great question, and you know it can vary certainly by by site type. But here, you know, we're looking at a site that's that's relatively manageable in size, and so um, different microbial and biological communities may have had uh, just the right amount of time in those 14 years to colonize over the whole. But given even some of the images uh, that Hans and others took in the, in the initial exhibition with Pearl, it was pretty clean. So it's going to be going to be really interesting to see, and I think potentially could uh, project expectations for a similar levels of marine growth on other you know, light metal underwater cultural heritage sites in the Pacific. Interesting. Kristen, I was just noting how we might not get to see much of the life that we uh, that the other shifts do, but how jellyfish have become quite a part of our repertoire as we're descending down, and how much I, I'm starting to enjoy them. And then someone let me know today's World Jellyfish Day. Oh, I didn't who even knew. I did not know. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we get to see all the kind of floating stuff that goes yeah. by. Yeah. <laughs> squid, sometimes fish, lots of jellyfish, like you said. Do you have a favorite that you've seen, anything that you've seen so far? Mm. I'm, I'm pretty partial at the moment to the manta that I saw yesterday. Yeah, but that was not... Uh, that was not... <laughs> I, I, <know. laughs> ROVs. I was not expected to see that <laughs> at all. But I'm so glad that I did. Yeah, I think we saw a ray on one of the deeper dives. And yes. that's really cool to see. So that is in our highlights for NautilusLive.org. And it is quite amazing to look. And it stuck around, too. It watched for quite a while. Yeah, it's interesting how quickly some of the stuff kind of scuttles off once it's like, oh, there's like all this light here. And it's, what is this thing? <laughs> I, I double checked. November 3rd is indeed World Jellyfish Day. How does one celebrate World Jellyfish Day, do you think? Yeah. I, it's a good question. I don't know how to, maybe just uh, illustrating one, maybe drawing mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not recommend picking them up off the beach and throwing them back in because you never know what type of jelly you might be touching. Might get more than you bargained for. <laughs> and illustrations, I think illustrations sound good. Maybe whip up some spaghetti, let the kids play with the noodles and create some. <laughs> <laughs> that could be fun. Yeah. Or how about doing some research about them? Exactly what I was thinking. Learning about them. Mm -hmm. Writing a little report. How large they grow. I. Um, I was on down the Gulf of Mexico uh, about a month ago and came across a green meanie 
Oh, wow. Yeah. I've never heard of that. And I was just absolutely fascinated. Um, I used my camera and my phone and just dipped the whole thing right in the water and got some really cool. Remind me, I'll show you the video. Yeah. It's really neat. Cool. So, green meanies. I have never heard of them, nor encountered them yeah. in the Gulf of Mexico, where yeah. I spend a fair amount of time. Yep. This is my first time seeing them there as well. Hmm. I think Are they from somewhere else? I, I, I don't remember if they said they're new to the area, hmm. um, but tentacles that can grow up to 70 feet long. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're carnivores, so they like other jellies. Oh. Particularly the uh, cannibal. Mm. Okay. Yeah. World Jellyfish Day. Good to know. Did not know it existed. It makes me wonder what tomorrow is going to be. Um, huh, look at it. Yep. There's always something. You're <laughs> going to have to start celebrating World Jellyfish Day in the classroom, I think. I think so. I'd like to do that. Jonathan looks like it's National Donut Day tomorrow. Ooh, I like We donut. should tell Chef. We should. Yeah. We should tell Chef. Donuts are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> or National Red Mitten Day, so we could all wear red mittens tomorrow. I don't think we need any mittens in here, <laughs> unless no. we're in the van. It gets a little cold in here. It's really a little chilly. Maybe Mike could knit us some mittens. <laughs> Mike could knit us some mittens. He sure could. You could too. How's your hat coming? Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to have to start over again. Oh. I'm going to have to consult Mike. I bet you with the time that we have less, you can probably just give it to him. He'll have it done by the time we get there. So on channel one, what you're seeing right yeah. now is a lot of marine snow. Um. And marine snow consists of detritus as well as uh, a lot of little microorganisms that live in the particular area. Detritus may be similar for you to explain, um, you know, how humans lose hair or skin cells just kind of shed. Same thing happens in the area. And from that, Kristen, you've been able to teach me a lot about eDNA and how we're able to use water samples to determine what types of organisms live in the area. Yeah, so I, I know on one of the previous expeditions, they were uh, filtering the water samples in the water column to, to do those eDNA e e samples um, and identify what they're looking at in the water column. Um, and so that's a, an interesting way to identify the animals that are living in the water column and also other things that have sort of transited through. Just fascinating to be able to, to understand that. And yes, thank you for correct, the correction of the, is it pink meaning you're exactly right. Um, I was looking at something that had the word green and it got stuck right in my head there, but a pink meaning, that's exactly what it was. It was quite beautiful, this jellyfish. It had a, a large gathering of a um, little school of fish around it that was using it as a, as a hideout place. Johan, just to, to further confidence in that depth is probably a really good assist for us is uh, the two reports from Hurl related to the bow 
the the main body of the sub. Uh, the main portion was 778 depth, and the bow was 777. So uh, I think, yep, that that depth contour is going to be our best bet. Okay, copy. And I just I stepped out, spoke to Dan a little bit, and he's got um, some feelers out to some other folks just to help confirm. So uh, we might get the assist from the beach if he hears anything back. Great. Zero meters due south, please. Due south, one eight zero, please. Thank you. Just to update everyone live, we're that's watching and listening at home. We appreciate you being here. We are on a dive mission today to uh, go and explore scuttled submarine from World War II. Um, we're looking for I-201. It's a high-speed submarine built by the Imperial Japanese Navy, uh, surrendered to the United States and then sunk. Um, we're hoping to get some information in regards to the deterioration process, what type of organisms might have called, or might are calling that home right now, and get some really good uh, immersive imaging 
as well. This uh, particular uh, yeah. Keep going. submarine has not been viewed in the past 14 years. So we're really curious to see how that process, what all has been taking place over, over that time. Johan, third uh, piece of intel, like another report from a hurl dive, 786 meters uh, being targeted up. So we're going deeper is definitely uh, to that 780s-ish range is, is where we want to be headed generally. And I, I do agree if you guys were talking about increasing the swath width you know, by coming up a bit or whatever it is, I'm all for. Yeah, okay. I appreciate everybody's patience. Let's just keep working this problem, you know, best, best inf off the best information we have, and I'm sure we'll we'll get there. We'll find it. Just another jelly in view. Is it appropriate to tell it happy jellyfish day? Oh, is that the, is it That's today. jellyfish day? Today is World Jellyfish Day. Did wow. you know that that existed? No, I, I'm, uh, I, I don't keep up with those, all the holidays. It seems like there's just too many to. Well, I want you to be prepared for tomorrow. Oh, let tomorrow me know. Tomorrow is National Donut Day as well as National Red Mitten Day. Oh, is, I see Mike's comment about yeah. the red mittens. All yeah. right, so, we'll so we were thinking we could get him to, you know, yeah. whip up a pair for everybody on board. <laughs> but he says there's not enough time. But then Slow Mo is also willing to participate in that as well. We've got a picture of Slow Mo that's uh, he's already working on it. We could talk to the galley staff. Maybe we could catch the donut portion. I literally, that was my thought. Tree, I was like, we yeah. need to let Chef know. We need to let them know now. That way we can prepare. Well, they could already be prepared. They had you know pumpkins. What? They I mean, That's they know true. they're on more on top of this stuff than we are. Yeah. So Yeah. <laughs> Considering the fact that they had the pumpkin that we were going ashore for, yeah, and didn't tell anybody, they probably have donuts ready to go. Yep. I'm just happy to know that Mike's listening to the SPL. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's while, a while we're trying to put him to work. <laughs> yeah, there's quite the crowd in the in the lounge. You know, I think this is one of the dives that folks are really looking forward to. So this is the submarine that's actually um, broken two. Yep. We have two two pieces that we could be looking at today. Yeah, it was described as the main body and then the bow. So maybe the bow section isn't. It wasn't like a 50-50. Oh yeah. Split of the structure. What's the contingency plan here? We're currently running Norbit, trying to get another view. Yeah, what's up? Uh, you could Thank you to those of you who are joining us. We are uh, in the general area of where we need to be right now, just kind of getting things uh, set up and getting all of our equipment together, making sure that we come in at the right angle. Um, we're going to be reviewing uh, an Imperial Japanese Navy submarine, I-201, today. It's been 14 years since we've had uh, any good cameras on this particular submarine. So we're very interested in looking at the deterioration process, seeing what type of uh, an ecosystem it's developed and turned itself into, as well as getting some immersive film uh, and imagery done for, for this. We've done the imagery, if you've been following along with us on each of our dives, as well as using the Norbit mapping system, and that's been giving us a really um, not just a visual view of uh, the topography of the area, but also allowing us to have some incredible 3D graphics that we've been able to establish from uh, some of the reef beds that we've been to in the basalt columnars, uh, the columnar basalt. So um, it's been an, a wonderful opportunity to work with this technology and have this equipment going, and we look forward to using that today to get some great images um, of, of these submarines. So as you're continuing to wait with us, we're just making sure that we're in the right position. I know that your satellite feed gives you lots of uh, views from 
satellite one from Hercules, you're looking at a lot of uh, marine snow and detritus that we're falling in the occasional jellyfish, which we've determined today is National Jellyfish Day. So there goes one out of view right now. So once we get to our location and we know exactly where uh, we want to come in, then we'll start that process. And this is, is the life of the first shift. All right, Kristen, we just kind of, we get things where they need to be and then we turn it over and let everybody else have all the, the visual fun. We do the technical, the technical work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's absolutely right, getting us to where we need to go. There's so much that goes on to, uh, you know, between the navigation and running the mapping system and then um, putting Hercules and, and at Atlanta right in the right spots. Mm -hmm. Getting all the cameras set up. Getting and all the cameras working properly, making sure everything is moving, running smoothly. We have uh, quite the responsibility of, of, of that. And we do it well. We do it well. So we are scheduled today. Um, we had scheduled for 11 hours. We had a little bit of a, a winch problem again this morning that we, we fixed rather quickly. The team came together and worked that out perfectly. Uh, so we, we only lost around a half hour there. And of course, there's always uh, the possibility the extension of the dive just depends on how things go. Um, I know that initially we had looked at if time allowed, uh, possibly looking at a, a, a second submarine um, that was also in the general area. And we'll just have to kind of see how that goes. And see if we can add that in. If not, we always have a dive scheduled for tomorrow as well. We'll be able to add those things in. So we'll be in this area um, so that you can join us for the rest of your time today and then tomorrow as well. And is the nature with science, sometimes things take a little longer than we expect them to, but when you get good science work, it's because you've put in the effort to do everything just so. so. That's what we're working towards right now. And as usual happens, right about the time we get off shift, that's when we find everything. So we're like, that's right. we're like 20 minutes from a shift change. So I anticipate that in 18 minutes, we will find what we're we looking will for. find exactly. Yeah. We'll be exactly where we are supposed to be, and we'll then do a shift change, and that'll just that'll be it. Yep. I would imagine that when we get to what we're looking for, we'll get some pretty uh, significant returns on the Norbit uh, mapping. It's hard to tell. It looks like right now we're just kind of looking at soft sediment to the bottom at least from the, my limited knowledge of what, you know, looking at these things over the past week and a half, two weeks. So this expedition has been uh, a two week venture and we're just about, just about at the end of it. And I just kind of want to uh, take a comment that just